So I want to begin today with a huge thank you, of course, to Heather Campbell Coyne and uh, the generous support of the Delaware Communities Forum. And a thank you to everyone who's here and everyone who has made this symposium possible today. I'm very excited and honored to be here. The Ash Can, School or Can of Problems. Emma Bellows, widow of artist George Bellows, was furious after reading a 1949 issue of Life magazine, which produced the painting Stag at Sharkies, here by her late husband. She criticized the editors for classifying Bellows as, quote, the last of the Ashkin school, a title she understood to be exclusively applied to the eight. And, emphatically, she wrote, George Bellows was not one of them. Emma continued, and I quote, I have always considered it highly insulting to designate as the Ashcan School such a distinguished group of artists as composed the eight, and feel it is about time someone spoke in a loud, strong voice against highlighting this Ashcan tag whenever these important men are mentioned. While Ash Can no longer retains such a negative connotation as we've seen from the exhibition and many of the papers today, this uh, exchange reminds us of the slipperiness of language. In my brief paper that follows, I re examine the origins of the Ash Can school term and trace its canonization to the late 1940s a full generation after Henry's death in 1929, and much later than previously suspected. Used to describe the gritty urban scenes of New York City life, Ashcan art has become synonymous with the early 20th century work of a group of artists including John Sloan and Robert Henry. Over the decades, numerous scholars have sought to uncover the term's origins. Ashcan has some historical precedent, and is commonly thought to come into regular usage in the 1930s. Where Wilmer Homer, William, excuse me, William Innes Homer traces Ashcan to Hodger Cahill and Alfred Barr's 1934 publication, Arts in America. However, in their publication, Cahill and Barr used two descriptors, the Ashcan School and Revolutionary Black Gang, to describe Henry's circle. Homer also cites a 1913 drawing by Bellows entitled Disappointments of the Ashcan, which was published in the Masses in 1913 and the Philadelphia Record two years later in 1915. This drawing was at the center of a dispute over artistic content in the Masses. Homer also cites Theodore Dreiser's novel The Genius from 1915, in which the main character, an artist modeled off of John Sloan, makes reference to garbage cans as an appropriate artistic subject. Lloyd Goodrich, writing in his much earlier biography of Sloan from 1952, admits the origins of the term are mysterious. This should raise our suspicions. A more fruitful question than when Ashcan was first used is when was Ashcan not used? And when did Ashcan become so narrowly defined? For example, when former Henry student Helen Appleton Reed wrote the introduction for the 1937 catalog, New York Realist 1900 to 1914, held at the Whitney Museum of Art, Reed uses Ashcan along with other epithets to describe the group, much in the same vein as Cahill and Barr. Even more telling is the glaring absence of the term for much of the 1940s. 1950s, however, mark a turning point in the term's use and definition. In 1949, art historian Milton Brown published a portion of his dissertation that would later become a seminal work, art, American Art Since the Henri Show, which was published in 1955. In his 1949 article entitled The Ashcan School, Brown discusses the Henry Circle Students and other realists, such as Glenn Coleman, Rockwell Kent, and Jerome Myers, but use it for the first time, the Ashcan School, as the singular term to describe Henry, Flesh George Luke's, 
William Watkins, John Sloan, and Everett Shin. Brown reinforces Ashcan's use in American art since the Armory Show, and it has been repeated in later surveys of American art. Ashcan, therefore, takes hold after 1949, not before. And as a direct result of Milton Brown's scholarship, Brown staked his claim in a similar fashion to 1940s comic book publishers use of what were called Ashcan copies. In order to claim copyright, comic book publishers released extremely limited runs to prevent encroachment from a rival publisher on titles or characters. Often hastily assembled or unfinished ash cans were, as their name implies, intended for the waste bin. The use of ash can in the world of comic book publishing at the same time doubly resonates with not only the perceived unfinished quality of Ashcan art, but also Brown's ownership of the Ashcan label when applied to Henry's Circle. Limiting Ashcan to five artists reflects the canonization process at work. Ashcan becomes a shorthand notation. Romantic and anachronistic, the term Ashcan sidelines the influence of these artists within the narrative of 20th century American art. In conclusion, the use Ashcan tells us much more about the state of American art and culture at mid-century than the work of artists nearly 50 years earlier. <coughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, Heather, for organizing what's been already a highly generative day of talks. <coughs> A woman leans over her fire escape to hang out the wash on a clothesline that stretches across her rear yard. The job nearly done, she pins an undergarment to the last available slot. The nearby window likely provided access to the small iron balcony, and a clothesline pulley system would have allowed her to utilize the entire width of the lot. Across the shared space between their apartments, John Sloan observed this woman carrying out ordinary chores and painted her. Sloan captured quotidian scenes, such as a woman's work from his lived experiences. Scenes of women hanging out their wash, in particular, provided inspiration for a near subgenre of his works, including Sunday women drying their hair, red kimono on the roof, and night windows. These and other light works document the activity experienced across the top level of tenement style buildings. Chapter three of my dissertation, which I'm not reading it now, it's a full dissertation. Uh, chapter three of my dissertation explores how Sloan's scenes of connectivity across these upper stories represent what I term urban voids, three-dimensional negative spaces in the metropolis that were either left over between buildings or had to be carved out and regulated by law. These voids were not actually empty, of course. They held natural light and air, precious elements in the gritty city. I posit that the laundry lines in Sloan's works call attention to these open, oft-communal spaces. When Sloan and his wife Dolly moved from Philadelphia to New York in 1904, he memorialized his first apartment in this sketch for Robert Henry. The unit at 165 West 23rd Street had a studio in the back with even northern light from three windows and a skylight. It was from here that Sloan glimpsed the scene pictured in a woman's work. As he recorded in his diary on March 11, 1912, quote, painted a woman hanging out wash on a fire escape, a thing I saw back of us. Rather interesting color, I think. Felt good in getting at it at any rate. A close reading of a woman's work sheds light on the social dynamics of these void spaces. The painting's straight on viewpoint seems to indicate that Sloan trained his canvas on the buildings directly opposite his studio, as he did in Pigeons of 1910, another work based on his back view. But a preparatory sketch and the Sanborn Company fire insurance map of 1911 suggest that in a woman's work, Sloan was looking northeast and possibly reoriented the scene of the painting. If this is the case, the building in question would be a boarding house, Share rental quarters with cheaper lodging and meals than hotels, and that's indicated in the word boarding on the same board map there. 
The woman might be a hired laundress or a boarder taking care of her own load. Her identity is not clear, despite the proximity some distance remains. When Sloan moved to Greenwich Village later in 1912 and began working from an 11th floor studio, his higher vantage point engendered similar themes, yet with more of a focus on rooftops. Wooden planks likely represent walkways constructed to ease roof access for laundry. Whether done by a laundress or a tenant, households were often assigned a day of the week to use these spaces. Sloan's laundry lines, therefore, signify the need for light air and ventilation to execute household tasks. Jacob Reese's earlier typical tenement fire scape of 1890 illustrates this extension of living space outdoors at the time. To be sure, these urban voids were contested spaces. From the 1867 reforms that required one privy for every 20 tenants and fire escapes, to the Tenement House Act of 1879, which mandated windows in all rooms, to the Tenement House Act of 1901 that called for larger air shafts in new buildings, uh, safe living conditions had to be legally enforced. And here I'm showing the decreasing percentage of the lot that a building could occupy under these successive laws. Um, and then just as an aside, um, due to a series of real estate owners' appeals, that 1901 law that I mentioned um, remained, well, as an act, and then it remained in legal abeyance um, until 1906 when it was affirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court two years into Sloan's New York life. And um, Sloan, John and Dolly Sloan had their own encounters with a tenant inspector, too, which is recorded in his diaries in their own apartment. And surely, as an artist, Sloan would have known about the importance of daylight and air to the quality of life. While Sloan, a socialist, claimed, claimed to keep politics separate from his art, urban issues are present in the spaces he depicts, and they are inevitably figured. Ultimately, Sloan presents an urban culture in turn-of-the-century New York, where laundry lines, almost as if telephone wires, symbolize interactions in these part-public, part-private spaces, jostled between a woman's sphere and the artist's eyes. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd also like to thank Heather for organizing this wonderful day of talks and, and papers. Uh, the title of my short paper at the top of the swing, John Sloan in the Playground Movement. In his journal on June 26, 1906, John Sloan noted a scene he witnessed at a playground in Tompkins Square Park. He wrote, quote, walked down to the east side this afternoon, enjoyed watching the girls swinging in the square, a fat man watching, seated on a bench, interested in the more mature figures. <laughs> Six years later, in 1912, he translated the episode into an etching, and also a drawing, which appeared on the May 1913 cover of The Masses. When interpreting these two works, scholars have rightfully noted the predatory gaze of the men at the periphery, who intently watch the girls playing on the swings. On the precipice of womanhood, the young girls play innocently, unaware that their levity has attracted the attention of men nearby. In the short study, I would like to consider instead how these two works relate to the playground movement in New York City. In the period discourse that arose concerning working class children and providing adequate places for play. As a middle class reform effort, the proliferation of public playgrounds in immigrant neighborhoods at the turn of the century sought to take working class kids off the streets and into controlled recreational spaces that were divided by gender and supervised by play monitors. While the design of New York's first playgrounds reflected Victorian values and their emphasis on proper morals through physical education, Sloan's depictions frequently celebrate the autonomy of urban youth who frequently evade reformer efforts to curtail their amusements. In 1898, Charles Stouffer and Lillian Wald founded the Outdoor Recreation League, which converted nine small parks and congested neighborhoods into playgrounds between the years 1903 and 1904, and that included one playground at Thompson Square Park. In her writings, Wald betrays one of the primary objectives of the playground movement, to provide a monitored place for productive play in order to curb criminal behavior. In a 1915 article for the Atlantic Monthly, she wrote, quote, the study of juvenile delinquency shows how often the young offender's presence in the courts 
may be traced to a play impulse for which there was no safe outlet." End quote. By introducing playgrounds into public spaces, reformers physically intervened onto the urban landscape itself to temper its rougher edges under a progressive agenda. Notably, Thompson Square Park was a con historically contentious site for working class unrest. In an 1897 report, the Committee on Small Parks recalled, quote, the day when Tom's, Tom, Tompkins Square was the dreaded tor storm center of the bread and blood riots, end quote, where they now recommended that, quote, an open space for children's use is badly needed upon its west and south sides, end quote. In an 1873 illustration from Home and Hearth, the artist here implies how the park was still suited for working class children. In the foreground, a gang of barefooted and undisciplined children run amok. Older kids look after babies, while two unconcerned adults converse in the background. Victorian upright sensibilities regarded such unruly behavior by the lower classes with apprehension and ultimately intervened with paternalistic action. By 1906, when John Sloan visited the park, there were 23 swings for the girls' section and two adult attendants keeping watch. Divided by gender, the playground's apparatus often determined the boys' and girls' side of the park. In a 1904 article about the city's newest playgrounds, the author remarked, quote, it is at the swings that girls and boys part company in the graduation of play, end quote. Whereas young children began in the sandbox by adolescence, quote, boys pass on to gymnastics and athletics and girls to the swings, end quote. Repeatedly, contemporary literature emphasized the importance of these new playgrounds to restrain the criminal behavior of young boys and girls. In an article, one author wrote, quote, if a boy cannot get exercise in a harmless way, he will take it by organizing the games, which stand around the various corners and among the passers-by. The girls, too, need the exercise to keep their minds occupied with healthful things. While progressives view the playground as an essential anecdote to adolescent criminality, Sloan captured instead the undisciplined play and joy of children. Without a play monitor in sight, the girls swing with complete abandon and do not conform to proper modesty by trying to cover their legs or pull up their stockings. <laughs> Simultaneously, Sloan's inclusion of the nefarious presence of men at the periphery reveals the futility of progressive efforts to isolate children from the city's dangerous elements. In numerous depictions, John Sloan captures the disorderly play of children in other etchings and drawings as they transform city streets into their own personal playgrounds. While such scenes would have dismayed middle-class reformers, Sloan's portrayals admire instead the creative play and independent freedom of working-class youth who manufacture their own entertainment in the city. Thank you. to echo everyone's thanks to Heather uh, and everyone else involved with the symposium. Uh, my research on John Sloan, which I'm titling here, John Sloan, Santa Fe Art and Politics, Negotiating the Paradoxes of Pueblo Preservation. Uh, this research is in the context of a dissertation that examines the intercultural dialogues between Anglo and Pueblo artists in Santa Fe, New Mexico during the first half of the 20th century. So here to the left, you see Sloan pictured with fellow painters Marsden Hartley and Randall Davey in 1919 in Santa Fe. It's the first summer that Sloan spent there. To the right, Sloan is seen with two unidentified men, one of whom is possibly Hartley, uh, as well as the famed Pueblo potter Maria Martinez and one of her children. Histories of the uh, modernists in New Mexico, Anglo artists, mainly traveling westward from New York, and American Indian modernism are really too often bifurcated. So my dissertation seeks to reweave these subjects and attest, moreover, that both Anglo and American Indian artists in Santa Fe were really grappling with how best to address the modern myths of authentic or genuine Indianness. I pay particular attention to Sloan's representation of Pueblo Indians, as well as his promotion of American Indian art, both of which really reveal his ambiguous attitude towards modern Native peoples in the United States. 
Sloan was an ardent preservationist, arguing for the protection of American Indian cultural traditions that differentiated Indian from Anglo society. He thus positioned himself against the aims of the assimilationists, who contended that eradicating those very cultural differences was the best way to deal with the, the so-called Indian problem. Sloan supported the preservationist cause by portraying Pueblo dances that were then under attack by assimilationists, and by encouraging the production and sale of American Indian artwork, perhaps most famously at the 1931 Exposition of Indian Tribal Arts, uh, which opened in New York. I argue that in each case, he promoted the authenticity of the American Indians with whom he aligned himself, although his manner of doing so reveals the very fallacy of this problematic concept. Sloan expected American Indians to adhere to an ethnographic present, a situation in which the authenticity of modern Native peoples is judged by the degree to which they look and act like preconceived notions that non-Native peoples have assigned their forebears. Although Sloan's paintings and his patronage nonetheless often reveal modern contact zones. Sloan's understanding of authenticity could not accommodate posing. He noted that he never asked Native models to pose in his studio, rejecting what he called, uh, quote, the picturesque or costume type of painting. And his work on the left pokes fun at an artist who did use posed American Indian models in his work, Julius Rolschoven, a member of the Taos Society of Artists. And while Rolschoven's completed work would look something like the work on the right, uh, with all markers of modernity removed, Sloan's painting reveals the facade by contrasting the model's stereotypical war bonnet and faraway gaze uh, with the quotidian Anglo contemporaneity of the shirt and slacks. Sloan was keen to depict Pueblo dances, however, as he viewed them as a more authentic expression of Indianness. During his first stay in Santa Fe in 1919, Sloan was immediately taken with the dances he witnessed, frequently portraying public portions of summer harvest dances over the next few years, which is what you see in these two works. Sloan's interest in Pueblo culture was peaked just as assimilationist forces were beginning to crack down on the dances that Stone enthralled him. Sloan threw himself into the preservationist cause, joining a coalition of Pueblo leaders and their preservationist supporters who eventually defeated the assimilationists' attempts to eradicate Native dances. And his continued portrayal of these dances during the years when they were most heavily under attack can be seen as evincing his preservationist support. Uh, in his dance depictions, Sloan does not always seek to conceal the modern context within which Pueblo peoples live. So here, for example, um, in works I realize are now up in the show now, I think in this exact order, actually, uh, we see tourists. However, the Pueblos themselves are, are usually shown enacting the kind of behavior that Sloan considered authentic in terms of their Indianness. If the present within which he and the American Indians he depicted lived is often quite evident, the latter uh, usually have the static, stereotypic look of timeless Indianness, even if their surroundings give the lie to this very timelessness. Sloan's promotion of American Indian art is likewise ambivalent. He recognized that the sale of such work could be an important source of revenue for American Indians within the modern economy, yet he railed against the degraded quality of art made solely for sale to tourists because such work did not display traditional craftsmanship. He also promoted easel paintings, uh, as you see here, produced by young Native artists, which were made using Anglo painting materials, but he judged these works for the degree to which they adhered to his own conception of authentic Indian imagery. In their introduction to the exposition catalog, Sloan and his co-writer, Oliver Lafarge, positioned the Pueblo watercolors against uh, what they call the miserable knickknacks sought by tourists, accepting the artist's adoption of Anglo easel painting because the works can still be considered satisfactorily Indian by their standards. 
In an interview, Sloan explained that the organizers rejected paintings that showed too much polish or finish, viewing them as tainted by the influence of American commercial art. This kind of bias continued to circulate. As we see in a before and after pamphlet Sloan received from the New Mexico Association on Indian Affairs, which bemoans Pueblo painters experimenting with more graphic styles. Sloan agreed that such comparisons show the regrettable degradation of Pueblo painting. His preservationist sense of an ethnographic present influenced his opinions on American Indian art, just as it had colored the way he produced his own renderings of Native life. Sloan's acknowledgment that American Indian peoples had entered the modern era alongside everyone else was tempered by his preservationist outlook, which allowed him to maintain the fantasy of an authentic Indian other. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And again, a hearty, hearty thank you to Heather um, and everyone here at the Delaware Art Museum and, of course, um, the Delaware Community Sloan for making today possible. Um, so my talk today is a very brief section of part of uh, my dissertation, which explores the convergence of art, female garment workers, and labor reform in late 19th century Britain, France, and the United States. Um, and, first of all, my apologies, the only color reproduction or I've ever been able to get or image of this work is one I took myself, so my apologies for quality. <laughs> In the decade leading um, up to the United States entry into World War I, John Sloan actively produced art in support of the cause for socialist publications like The Masses and The New York Hall. One particularly vehement image, the uh, In Memoriam, Here is the Real Triangle, um, published in the New York Hall on March 27, 1911, which you can go see in the show today. Um, this image reflects the type of bare-faced political cartoons that Sloan produced for such publications in the 19-teens, created in response to one of the most memorable and most devastating industrial disasters in American history, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, in which 146 garment workers died when a fire broke out on the locked workrooms on the top three floors of a 10-story building. Sloan's drawing depicts the lifeless, scorched body of a woman, enclosed within a large black triangle, the symbol for the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, emblazoned with the words rent, property, and interest. The skeletal figure of death and a fat cat capitalist watch over this desolate scene, signifying that blame for this woman's fate rests at their feet. Sloan's visual language and position on this issue are clear in this cartoon as he lays his politics bare. Such blatant pronouncements of political meanings, however, do not overtly appear in either Sloan's paintings or his etchings of the same period. In fact, when Sloan began creating imagery for the cause, he became adamant about drawing a distinction between his political illustrations and his artistic works. <coughs> stating in 1909 that he, quote, had no intention of working for any socialist object in his etchings and paintings, end quote. At least one earlier painting, however, The Sewing Woman of 1901, stands as a key exception to that rule, created well before the artist either joined the Socialist Party or asserted that he was excluding politics from his non-graphic works, Sloan himself noted that, quote, the little dressmaker, uh, one of a series of different titles that has been used in this work, that, quote, the little dressmaker, a girl at a sewing machine, may also have social content, end quote. An almost monochromatic image, Sloan's painting is very shallowly constructed with the figure of a pretty, pale young woman eyes closed as she breaks from her work, and seated behind a work table in a large black sewing machine that blocks her into the scene like a barricade. While Sloan's sewing woman may not read as explicitly political to an unwitting viewer today, 
The subject matter engages with a long discourse in the visual and literary arts concerning the plight of garment workers. One that began in Britain in the mid 19th century with the publication of Thomas Hood's lightning rod poem, The Song of the Shirt, in, December 1840, in the December 1843 issue of Punch, quickly followed by the exhibition of Richard Redgraves, The Semstress, at the Royal Academy six months later in 1844. The combination of Hood and Redgraves' works established an enduring international tradition of using female garment workers to address concerns about industrial working conditions. And I will just note, we are still using the song of the shirt as shorthand for uh, bad labor practices in garment production with um, some of the events that have been happening in places like Bangladesh, people are still bringing up the song of the shirt. So it's something still relevant today. Possibly in a nod to the song of the shirt, which bemoans the oppressive labor faced by ready-made shirt makers, the white fabric being stitched in Sloan Sewing Woman with what appears to be a scalloped cuff-like edge could very well be a shirt like that of Hood's poem. Beyond this potential allusion to the, the song of the shirt, the unavoidable prominence of the foregrounded sewing machine additionally would have imparted social content to Sloan painting. Though initially hailed as a labor-saving device in the 1850s, by the time Sloan was painting, the machine had long been viewed by activists and reformers as a symbol of worker exploitation. Though it did, in fact, aid worker productivity, the sewing machine also inadvertently produced new forms of abuse by expanding the ready-made clothing industry, which further de-skilled and devalued the needle trades and, by the 1880s, had developed into the highly oppressive sweatshop system. By as early as the 1860s, Karl Marx was pointing to the sewing machine as the quintessential machine of capitalist consumer economy, declaring in his legendary treatise Capital that, quote, the fearful increase in death from starvation during the last 10 years runs parallel with the extension of machine sewing. Wherever the sewing machine locates itself in narrow and already overcrowded workrooms, it adds to the unwholesome influences." End quote. Marx thus pinpoints the sewing machine as the harbinger of ruin and death. Nearly half a century later, Sloan's positioning of the sewing machine in the extreme foreground of the image would have signaled, signaled this exploitive system of industrial labor to his viewers. And were they somehow unaware of these connotations, the hostility with which the machine blocks the seamstress, uh, a seamstress which one reviewer in 1904 described as a, quote, animated corpse, end quote. <laughs> um, I, the machine blocks the seamstress, trapping her in the seam and ostensibly into her exhaustive employment. Along with the shirt and the sewing machine, symbols of exploitive industrial work, Sloan's choice to depict an exhausted garment worker would have been particularly prescient in 1901. Though labor tensions had been mounting in the United States since the Civil War, the last two decades of the 19th century saw an intensification of reform initiatives and worker strikes as an increasing number of unions organized and laborers banded together to fight for better working conditions. On June 3rd, 1900, the year before Sloan created his sewing woman, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, or the ILGWU, the first national organization for garment workers and the first labor union whose membership consisted primarily of female workers, was founded in New York by a Congress of delegates from northeastern cities, primarily from New York and Philadelphia. The cause of garment workers had intensified over the previous two decades, gaining increasing national attention with the outcry against sweatshops and through the efforts of social reformers like Jacob Rees, who championed their cause and education and educated the American public through works like How the Other Half Lives. Within this framework, Sloan's choice to depict an exhausted garment worker 
barricaded into a bleak, oppressive space by a symbol of both her employment and her exploitation, it is easy to understand how this early painting may indeed contain social content. Thank you. Uh, for three weeks in November 1895, John Sloan served as the artistic director of a literary magazine based in Philadelphia. The paper derived its moniker, Geobois, as well as its visual program and organizational structure from a French periodical of the same name that had been in circulation since 1891. The Parisian Geobois Illustré is itself a weekly supplement to the already successful and decade-old daily paper featured serialized novels and illustrations by some of the most famous writers and artists of the day. For instance, a chapter from Gustave Droz's um, popular novel, Monsieur, Madame, et Bebe, was printed in the first issue on May 30th. Giobla Illustré proved to be a successful enterprise, earning a reputation for intellectual and originality both at home and abroad. The extent of this popularity is revealed by Sloan's attempt to recreate the supplement in Philadelphia just four years after its initial publication. I came across the rare editions of Sloan's Giobla on a trip to the Delaware Art Museum, made as part of a, of a graduate level art history seminar, and seminar entitled Transatlantic Modern. This course traced the movement of art, artists, dealers, collectors, and critics through the Atlantic world of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Indeed, the class itself was an experiment in transatlanticism, as it was co-taught between the University of Delaware and the Courtauld Institute in London. This reliance on virtual communication was reflected in its final assignment, a digital humanities project. With this aim in mind, I created this online resource that attempts to locate Sloan's Jiuhua within growing international and intermediate constellations of modern mass culture. An interactive map um, at the bottom of the journey page highlights the places and faces in Paris and Philadelphia involved in the production of folk papers. Unfortunately, it is difficult to ascertain how Sloan first encountered the French Journal. Despite his prolific correspondence with close friends like Robert Henry and William Blackens, both of whom traveled to Paris on multiple occasions, there are no specific references made to show Bois. It was Henry, however, who first introduced Sloan to the French illustrators. This, in turn, sparked an admiration for the primary illustrator of Geobois, Théophile Steinlein. Looking on the artist tab, um, elaborates upon this outspokenly influential relationship with which Sloan adamantly linked to Simon's aesthetic rather than activist program. <coughs> the juxtaposition of two covers, the left by Simon and the right by Sloan, illustrates this cranly graphic affinity. The images themselves link to pages that tell a bit more about each artist and their respective moves. Returning to the journey, Um, I suggest that Sloan's interest in Geobois may also be tied to his love of French realist literature. He recalled that he would often read the translations of Zola and Balzac while working at the bookstore Porter and Coates. Realist novels by Zola and others were frequently published in Geobois. For example, the cover at right announces the serialization of Lourdes in 1894. Um, linked Volume, which, volume one of which can be read by clicking on the image. Regardless of how Sloan discovered Chiopla, there is concrete proof that he was aware of it almost immediately. In the artist's personal manuscript collection, um, at the Delaware Art Museum, there are several leads from various issues of the Parisian Journal, which can be uh, in the gallery. Among the nine preserved, 
7 pertain to the act of parking <coughs> itself. They reference our pincerdonically studio practices such as sculpting, drawing, or painting from life, as well as comment upon the status of various genres within the hierarchy of artists. The artistic ethos of Jobot large clearly appealed to Sloan, for he directly adopted the journal's layout and color scheme. The front page illustrating the literary work published within was immediately preceded by that very text, which typically filled two pages. This was followed by another full page illustration or a series of vignettes, sometimes accompanying shorter pieces of writing. Next came a page of advertisements. Each issue concluded with an illustrated song sheet. Beyond this structural replication, Sloan also reprinted images and text previously published in the French paper. For instance, Sloan also reprinted, uh, for instance, Sloan reproduced the same photograph of Falconier's Le Repas de Midi that circulated in Paris the previous March. During the Philadelphia version's short print run, Sloan also published a poem by Paul Verlaine, whose prose appeared consistently in Giobois Illustrated, often illustrated by Seton himself. Other poems were likewise, likewise translated from the original French and printed in Sloan's paper. Surely Sloan hoped to benefit from this seemingly foolproof formula that had been so prosperous abroad. Unfortunately for Sloan and his collaborators, however, the American version did not attain the French Giobois success just the opposite. By its third edition, the paper was bankrupt. However, this small archive nonetheless confirms the privileged place of illustrated periodicals within the networks of transatlantic creativity emerging between the US and Europe at the turn of the century.